your truth and the message that you have for us today. In your name, amen. Amen, amen. Church, as you're seated, can you give this team in the front and the tech booth in the back just a round of applause? Man, thank you guys so much for leading us this morning. Uh, my name's Austin, um, and I'm on the team here at the church. And as, as I was greeting outside, I noticed some people that have been longtime members of this church. I also saw some folks that it looks like they may be first-time attenders of this church. And every week, it's a mixed bag of folks. And so whether you've been here for 30 years or you've been here for 30 minutes, uh, we simply want to be a Jesus centered church for the people of Los Angeles and ultimately to the entire world. So there's three things we want to do really well. First is we just want to know Jesus better. We want Jesus to be the center of everything that we do. And we think that as we keep Jesus the center, we will actually begin to grow in faith, putting more of our hope, trust, an allegiance in Jesus. And as we do that, he begins to shape us from the inside out. He begins to form us in a unique way to go out and serve the world beginning in our homes. And then with our neighbors, folks in the workplace, people in this church, and ultimately to the ends of the earth. And so this morning as we seek to know Jesus grow in faith and go serve. We're going to continue our Genesis series. We're in a series uh, this fall that's going to take us from Genesis chapter 6 all the way through Genesis chapter 11. And this is a series that is piggybacking on our Back to the Garden series last fall, which took us from Genesis chapter 1 all the way to Genesis chapter 5. And we're continuing to spend time in Genesis because as Trevor often says, if you don't get Genesis right, you won't get anything else right. And so this morning, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 6, and we're going to begin about five weeks in the story of Noah. And today, I'll be specifically talking about the origins of Noah and that famous story of Noah and the ark. And so we'll be in Genesis chapter 6, verses 8 through 22 this morning, if you have a smart Bible or kind of your analog Bible. But I want to give you five different ideas from Genesis chapter 6, verses 8 through 22, that I think will be helpful for you and your family to reflect on, talk about, and pray through throughout the week. And before we get started, I, I want to note at the onset that today we will not be talking about uh, the historicity of Noah's flood. We will not be talking about the scientific evidence for Noah's flood. And we aren't going to talk about some of the corresponding flood narratives from the surrounding ancient Near East, although you can go study, research, and read all of those things on your own time. This morning, we want to talk about five things that come directly from the text. The first is Noah's righteousness. The second is the world's wickedness. Third is God's instruction. Fourth is God's promise. And fifth is Noah's obedience. Again, that's Noah's righteousness, the world's wickedness, God's instruction, God's promise, and Noah's obedience. But I want to start with this, and if you're here kind of during the offering moment, I kind of want to pivot back to that space just a little bit, and I want you to take a moment to reflect on your upbringing, your current situation, or stories you've, hold about, you've heard about people from your family, and I want you to kind of envision that person that you feel like kind of had their world rightly ordered. It was the kind of person that when they spoke, they spoke with gravitas, but they also spoke with comedy and levity. It was the kind of person that when you looked at their life, it looked like their finances were ordered in such a way that they were taking care of their family, they were being generous, but they were also enjoying the fruit of their labor. The kind of person that when you heard about their week, you recognized, yeah, they were in church on Sunday, but they were also at the National Park on Saturday. The kind of person that just seemed like, man, you're just living well before God and well before people. It may be one of your parents in your home, maybe a teacher 
at school. It may be somebody in the workplace. It may simply be a neighbor. It may be somebody from this church. And I can think of several people from this church that fit that description. When we hop into Genesis chapter 6, specifically verses 8 through 10, the author of Genesis paints that kind of picture of Noah, a man who had his life ordered rightly. This is chapter 6, beginning in verse 8. It says, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 9, these are the generations of Noah, and it says this, it gives three descriptions of Noah. Noah was a righteous man. He was blameless in his generation, and Noah walked with God. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Note these three things that the author attributes to Noah. First is that he's righteous. The idea of being righteous was that you lived a just life. You lived according to the law. You lived according to obedience to your parents, to the church, and to civil authorities. In other words, you were kind of obedient to the tradition of faith and life in your world. And then secondly, you were Blameless. The idea of blameless is being complete, being whole, being sound, living a modest, moderate, balanced life. And finally, walking with God. It was this idea that obedience and blameless wasn't rigid, but it was relational. It was Noah living according to the law before God, living rightly before his peers, but also walking with God in relationship with him, kind of has this Enochian flavor, if you will, when the author of Genesis attributed, attributed the idea of Enoch walking with God. In other words, when you imagine Noah, you imagine a man who is living in ordered, right, sound, complete, whole, just kind of life. The kind of life you seek to live in your home, in the workplace and in the church. So Genesis is painting this picture of Noah, which will later be contrasted with the world. But notice what um, an old author named Matthew Henry says about Noah. I love this quote. He says, we have here Noah distinguished from the rest of the world, um, separated, living a peculiar kind of life compared to the rest of the world. A unique mark of honor and favor put upon him. When God was displeased with the rest of the world, he favored Noah. For there being one good man, he found him out and he smiled upon Noah. Noah was made a vessel of God's mercy when all mankind besides had become the generation of God's wrath. The world hated and persecuted Noah. Because both by his life and preaching, he condemned the world, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Let this be the summit of our ambitions, to find grace in the eyes of the Lord, to live a life that God smiles on. This is why living the Christian life is so important in every area of our lives. The the Christian life invites us into living an ordered, obedient life before our peers. It invites us to live a whole, sound, a blameless life before God. It invites us into the, the dynamics of not just living a rigid life, but a very relational life in walking with God. And we see in the text that when we live that kind of a life, it's the kind of life that God looks down on and smiles on. Look at that person living well in their homes. They have my favor. Look at that person living well before me when no one's looking. They have my favor. Look at that person who's not living simply rigidly, but relationally before me, walking and talking with me. They have my favor. When I think about the Christian life, that's the kind of life I want to live. A life that's well-ordered and balanced before the Lord, that I might have his 
smile. That when God searches the earth, he might look at me and say, man, Austin's got my favor. And so one of the prayers I was praying this week that might be helpful for you to pray throughout the week is, Lord, may I live a righteous, blameless, and walking with you kind of life that your smile might be upon me. And so this morning, are you living righteous before your peers? Are you living blameless before God? Are you living in such a way that you're not living rigidly, but living relationally before the Lord, walking with him and talking with him throughout the day? That's the first thing we see in the text is Noah's righteousness. The second thing we see in the text is the world's wickedness. This is verses 11 to 13. It's just talked about Noah being righteous, blameless, and walking with God. Verse 11 says, but, but now the earth, the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God told Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people. For the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. Note this, this change in uh, attitude in the text. Talking about the uprightness, the justice, and the, the blamelessness of Noah, and then how bad the world is. Author of Genesis is making a note that life apart from God is disastrous. A non righteous life is disastrous. Not seeking to live a blameless life is disastrous. Living in a rigid way in which you're not living in relationship with God is disastrous. In other words, refraining from life with God is a really bad idea. We see this in other areas of our lives as well. If we refrain from exercise, it's disastrous for our strength. If we refrain from nutritious food, it's disastrous for our health. If we refrain from relationships, it's kind of disastrous for us mentally because we become isolated and alone. In the same way, refraining from seeking out a life in which we please God, righteous, blameless, upright, walking with him is actually disastrous for us. And not just for us personally, but for our homes and our neighborhood and our broader community. In other words, walking away from God and not walking with God is not a neutral endeavor, but it is immediately disastrous for us. Uh, Derek Kinder, a uh, commentator on the book of Genesis, he notes this about the text. He says, when, when Genesis chapter 6 is talking about that idea of the world being corrupted or destroyed, uh, that Hebrew word makes it plain that, watch this, what God decided to destroy had virtually self-destructed on its own. In other words, the world had chosen to live in such a way. They had become so abysmal on their own that they had self-sabotaged themselves, self-destroyed themselves. And so God decided, I'm just going to go ahead and clean the slate and start over with Noah. The truth is, for us, if we're honest, and this is a really, really broad stroke, but most of the times when our life is in the gutter, they are self-inflicted wounds. It is poor decisions that we have made over and over and over again. It's unwise decisions that we have made over and over and over again. In other words, oftentimes when our, <laughs> our life is in the stink, it's our own fault. This text gives us that same kind of idea about the world. It's not this idea that the world was 95% good, but it was missing that 5%, and so God was starting over. It's this idea there were so many self-inflicted wounds. They had essentially destroyed themselves, and so God decided, I'm just going to start over. And again, this is why the Christian life is so important, not just that we would have God's favor 
and God's smile on our life, but to choose the opposite is not neutral, but it is destructive for our lives. So, so my prayer this week, Lord, have mercy on me. <laughs> Help me, because sometimes I don't make the right choices, but I want to, and I want to live with your smile on my life. And so here's a question to reflect on. What are some areas of your life that need to be decorrupted? What are some areas of your life that need to be de-self-sabotaged? What are some areas of your life when you need to say, Lord, I need to start seeking out righteousness instead of unrighteousness. I need to seek out living a life that's just and not unjust. I need to start seeking out a life that's walking with you, not walking away from you, aside from you, or independent of you. That's the second point, the world's wickedness. The third point is God's instruction in this passage. This is verses 14 and 16. So God gives these instructions to Noah. He says, make yourself an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark, and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. Its breadth, 50 cubits. And its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and set the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. In other words, kind of a, a three-story ark here. Um, these are interesting details that we might be um, quick to want to overlook. And all throughout church history, church fathers have kind of allegorized some of these details, and I don't really want to get into that, but I do want to to mention this, um, it's good to listen to instruction when instruction is given to us. It's an old phrase you probably heard from your parents. It's a phrase you probably heard from your teacher or from a boss or from a good friend. And it's these words, just trust me. Instructions on how to go home and make things right with your spouse, just trust me. How to have favor in the workplace, just trust Trust me. Anytime you're embarking on a new endeavor assigned to you, someone will give you specifics or instructions or a playbook about how to navigate it. And oftentimes, we kind of want to go out on our own and figure it out by ourselves, but more often than not, it's helpful just to trust the people that have given us instruction. For Noah in this moment, the ark is instructed to be 400 feet long. 73 feet high, 44, I'm sorry, 440 feet long, 73 feet wide, 44 feet high, and be able to displace about 43,000 tons. It ought to have a sky roof, a side door, and three stories. And you can imagine, while we don't know if Noah was an uh, uh, expert ship builder or not, and while we don't know if Noah quite knew how to sail or not, he probably had some of his own ideas of, Man, if I'm bringing a lot of animals on this ark, I think this is how I would do it. But in this text, God invites Noah to say, hey, you just need to trust me. This is going to need to have this many rooms, this many stories, and you're going to want a sunroof. Who doesn't love a good sunroof? Matthew Henry, again, kind of commenting on this text, talks about the importance of following this kind of divine wisdom and instruction and the obedience that comes with it. He says, God could have secured Noah by the, by the ministration of angels without putting him to any care or pains or trouble or work himself. But God chose to employ Noah in making that which was to be the means of his preservation, both for the trial of his faith and his obedience. Both the providence of God and the grace of God own and crown the endeavors of the obedient and of the diligent. God gave him very particular instructions concerning this building, which could not be, which could not but be admirably well fitted for the purpose when infinite wisdom itself was the architect. This is one of the reasons why I love scripture, is we are getting infinite wisdom from the creator of life itself. And so as much as I'm tempted to be stubborn and disobedient at times, it is helpful for me to come before the text and recognize 
this has been inspired by infinite wisdom, the creator of life itself. I should heed its instruction. I should simply just trust it. How to give and how to spend my money. When the text talks about it, I should trust it. When how to live the life of singleness and how to be married, I ought to trust it. When how to work hard but also enjoy the fruit of your work, I ought to trust it. It is actually to our deep detriment if we don't just trust God, even when we don't understand or when we think we have a better idea. And so one of my prayers this week was, Lord, help me to be wise. Help me to be obedient to your instruction and to your wisdom. And so here's a a question for you to ponder this week. Do you live according to your own ideas or according to the instruction of the Lord? Do you live according to your own wisdom or culture's wisdom or the wisdom of the Lord? This text invites us, like Noah, to trust God in his instruction, in his knowledge, and in his wisdom. This is point number four, God's promise, beginning in verse 17 to 21. God says, for behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. Verse 18, but I will establish my covenant with you. And you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. Verse 19, and of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Verse 20, of the birds according to their kinds and of the animals according to their kinds, of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind, two of every sort shall come into you to the ark to keep them alive. Verse 21, verse 21, Also take with you every sort of food that is eaten and store it up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. This small little passage here reminds us that God is a promise maker. He's a covenant keeper. And he promises Noah in this moment, uh, on the other side, I'm going to make a promise with you. On the other side, I'm going to make a covenant with you that I will always be with you. If you're a student, this is a pinky swear moment. This is a cross my heart and hope to die moment. If you're an adult, this is a marriage covenant moment. This is an international political alliance moment. And the times when you make these kinds of promises and these kinds of covenants, the primary purpose is a promise that when things get hard, I will be there for you. When things get hard in this marriage, I will be there for you. When things get difficult on the geopolitical spectrum, I will be there for you. When things get difficult on the playground, I will be there for you. This ought to be a sobering moment for us when we reflect on this text. Because God is about to destroy everything. And life on the other side of the flood will not be paradise. It will be very hard. It will be very challenging. And it will be very difficult and most likely very smelly. They will need God's promise of his presence on the other side. And God gives it to them. This is what, again, Kidner says about this moment. He says, Noah will go into the ark not as a mere survivor, but as the bearer of God's promise of the new age to come. Hamilton, in a a similar note, notes that God's promise is always helpful for us on the other side of disaster. He says, before God banished Adam and Eve from the garden, he clothed them. Before he exiled Cain, he placed a mark on him to protect him. And here, God announces his covenant with Noah before he sends his flood. In other words, as 
people that live the Christian life before God, we are also carriers of that promise. When things get really hard, God will be with us. When things are difficult, we will have his presence. And you may not be in a difficult time now, but trust me, hard times are coming. Difficult times at some point are around the corner. But we have promises from God that no matter how difficult it gets, no matter how dire it seems, he will be with us. So it's, a, it's actually a good spiritual discipline that when you're not in difficulty, to start memorizing God's promises. When you're not in a trial, to meditate on God's promises. When things are going well, to remember passages like, I will never leave you or forsake you. Because at some point in your life, you will need those promises. And you will need to recall them and hold on to them. So that was one of my prayers this week. Lord, teach me to hold on to your promises. That's one of my questions for us this morning. Um, do you read God's word as promises to you? Promises that you can put in your back pocket and access when things get challenging at home, challenging in your finances or challenging in the workplace. I would encourage you, if you don't, you should. And finally, this is point number five, verse 22. I love that Noah hasn't said anything yet. <laughs> He's just living before God and God's given him all this inside information and instruction. And in verse 22, instead of Noah chirping back with his own ideas or negotiations, verse 22 simply says, and Noah did it. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. I love the author using this double emphasis to double down on Noah's obedience. He says, Noah did this. And then immediately following, he repeats himself. He did all that God commanded him, not leaving anything out. Sometimes you hear people talk like this when they want to bring a certain emphasis to something they're talking to you about. They may say something like, dude, you won't believe it. Trust me, it's incredible. Or dude, it was unbelievable. I mean, it was absolutely out of this world. Or as people told me about two years ago, having a puppy is hard. I cannot oversell it to you how difficult it is. <laughs> Trying to bring home a point by double emphasizing it. And here in Genesis, the author emphasizes doubly Noah's obedience. Not his knowledge not his information, not his philosophy, but simply his obedience to God. Again, Matthew Henry wrote a lot of good stuff on this passage. I'm going to quote him one more time here. But he, Matthew Henry is talking about Noah and his obedience. And this became a prayer for me that I'll pray in just a moment. He says, Noah's obedience was ready and it was resolute. Thus did Noah willingly and cheerfully, without murmuring and disputing and talking back. God says, do this, and Noah does it. It was also punctual, on time, and persevering. He did everything exactly according to the instructions given him. And having begun to build, he did not leave until he had finished it until he had completed his obedience. As did Noah, so must we do. In other words, our obedience matters. Information is helpful. Prayer can be centering. Worship can be powerful. But at the end of the day, we're called to obedience. Obedience to everything that God has commanded of us. And hearing this, it, it ought to humble us. Because we recognize that we are not obedient in everything. It's one of the reasons why I love our church does a prayer of confession every morning. 
It is this sobering moment in which we remember afresh we have not been fully, resolutely, and readily obedient to God. But every Sunday we get to renew our commitment to confess our sin, to be assured that our disobedience has in fact been forgiven. And so again, I turned that um, Matthew Henry quote into a prayer and it sounded like this, Lord, help my obedience to be ready and resolute. Lord, help me to obey willingly and cheerfully. Lord, help me to obey without murmuring, disputing, or talking back. Lord, help me the things that you say, may I do them. Lord, may my obedience be punctual and persevering. May I do everything according to your instruction. And when I begin my obedience, may I finish my life in obedience. So a question for us, are you being obedient? And maybe the other side, where are you not being obedient? in the way that you handle your finances, in the way you're conducting yourself in the home, in the way you work before the Lord in the workplace, in the way that you treat your neighbors, where are you being disobedient? Because this morning is a great morning to say, Lord, help me to be obedient. Help me to repent and to turn. And with that being said, we want to come to the table this morning as we kind of move into a moment of Repentance, recognizing again our disobedience, remembering that we are forgiven and recommitting our obedience to the Lord. And so I want to invite those that are doing communion and that are serving communion to go ahead and come forward. And essentially this is the gospel in short. We are creatures that have in fact been created by God and we have not lived righteously. We have not lived blamelessly. We have not walked before God. Christ is truly the one who lived a righteous life, a blameless life, a walking with God kind of life. I love this quote from Brandon Smith from the Gospel Coalition. He says, so while a wooden ark delivered Noah from physical death, a wooden cross delivers us from spiritual death. Just as Noah obeyed God by climbing onto a boat to save a few, Jesus obeyed his father by climbing onto a cross to save many. Through God's design, the one who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. By God's invitation, your sin can be forgiven. And you can become the righteousness of God through Christ. So as you're ready this morning, would you come forward and receive the elements?